Hello and welcome everyone to the third of our six Cafe Sci Talks this summer. Before I get started, I wanted to, um, to thank our sponsor, H.M. Payson. So as a nonprofit institute, really every, all of the work that we do is really made possible with the help of our generous supporters um, and also the hard work of our donors, our board members and our advisory board members. So I wanted to say thank you to all of them um, and since much of our funding is from the federal government, anyone that pays taxes, I thank you as well. I especially wanted to thank H.M. Payson. So H.M. Payson is a main based financial advisor uh, who has been a long term partner of Bigelow's and who sponsors our Cafe Science series each year. So thank you very much, H.M. Payson. So uh, please use the question and answer button during the seminar. If you have any questions, it's located at the bottom. Um, at, we will have a break midway through and then at the end and we'll try to answer as many of the questions as we can. Um, there's also a raise hand and a chat button at the bottom, but in webinar mode, those aren't functional. So, um, so don't, don't try using those. So now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Maya Groner. So Maya received her PhD at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, she then went on to do two postdocs, which are additional training that you can get in other institutions. Uh, one was at the Atlantic Veterinary College, and she did a second at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, which is actually where I spent um, 17 years before I came to uh, Bigelow. She is a biologist by training. She is currently a research ecologist at the Prince William Sound Science Center in Cordova, Alaska, and is an affiliate scientist at the US Geological Survey Western Fisheries Research Center, which is in Seattle. So earlier this year, uh, she competed in a national search that included 113 applicants for a new senior research scientist position at Bigelow. And I'm very excited to say that we selected her, we offered her the job and she took it. Um, she will be joining us this November. So one of the things about our <coughs> scientists is they have to um, raise most of their uh, salary through grants and contracts. And she has been very successful and has a number of projects going on right now, some of which you'll hear about today. Um, one is on forecasting epizootic shell disease in lobsters in Atlantic Canada. Another is uh, studying an emerging eye disease of snow crabs in the Bering Sea. Another is um, learning to understand the transmission of eel grass wasting disease. And the last one is quantifying the effects of disease on Pacific herring populations. So with that, I'm very pleased to give you Dr. Maya Groner. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for taking the time to come to the talk today. Uh, I am so thrilled to be joining uh, the scientists at Bigelow in November and really excited to share my research with you all today. I'm going to split my talk into two parts. The first part will go over kind of the background of marine disease ecology, which is the majority of the research I do. And then the second half of the talk is going to be about uh, disease in uh, the American lobster, which I think will be of interest to folks in Maine. So I didn't actually plan to be a disease ecologist. When I was in graduate school, I was studying amphibians in wetlands and trying to understand what affects their populations. And there was a disease outbreak that um, actually is global and affected numerous species of amphibians worldwide. And it really um, it created an opportunity for me to study disease and uh, really, um, imparted to me just how important disease is in regulating populations um, and how it can have very fast and surprising impacts. Uh, so I've devoted my career to studying disease and um, have really shifted mostly to marine diseases at this point. Um, so disease is the result of an interaction uh, between a host and uh, marine environments. This could be a sea urchin or a whale or an eelgrass or algae, and it interacts with some kind of pathogenic agent. So this could be a virus or bacteria, it could be a sea louse. And whether or not that interaction results in disease uh, is dependent upon numerous factors. And in particular, 
the environment where the interaction is occurring. And by the environment, I mean the physical environment. So the, the uh, seawater temperature and pH and movement of seawater, which might move pathogens uh, into different areas or um, make them flow out of an area uh, where they would have otherwise uh, exposed an organism. Um, and I also mean the biological environment. So all of the other organisms that that host and pathogen might be interacting with. So if conditions are right uh, for disease and it emerges, um, you might see things like uh, eelgrass wasting disease in this top right corner, which causes these black lesions in eelgrass, uh, sea star wasting, which is um, hypothesized to be due to an infectious disease, although um, that agent hasn't yet been discovered. Sea star wasting is something that occurs on the Pacific Northwest. And just to give you an idea of just how dramatic of an impact a disease can have, this affects more than 20 species of sea stars, has led to major declines in many of them, and um, just over the past uh, seven years, and has led to the federal listing of one sea star species. Uh, numerous coral diseases have uh, emerged. Uh, in recent years. And um, then in this bottom left corner, the disease I'm most interested in sharing with you all today, which is epizootic shell disease in the American lobster. I'm particularly interested in understanding what causes disease to emerge and then uh, what the impacts of disease are on populations. And in particular, I'm interested in the effects of climate change on disease in the oceans. So climate change has numerous impacts on our oceans from uh, changing ocean pH to uh, melting sea ice to more uh, coastal flooding and sea level rise. Um, but for this talk, I'm really going to focus on seawater temperature. And that's not because any of these other factors aren't important. Uh, but this is really the low hanging fruit for us studying marine disease that we have a lot of temperature data and it turns out disease is very much affected by temperature. Uh, so it's, it's something that we often study and we find pretty dramatic effects of uh, ocean temperature on disease emergence. Um, temperature is affected by uh, climate change in numerous ways. We see different amounts of variation in the highs and lows of seawater temperature changing seasonality of temperature. So maybe winter is a little bit shorter, and the summer temperatures last a little longer. And then we're also seeing uh, heat waves, which are periods of extended high temperature that could last a uh, few days to, uh, in some cases, a couple of years. These changes in temperature can alter uh, processes in both the pathogens and the hosts that they infect. Uh, so in pathogens, this could lead to changes in microbial communities, uh, faster growth rates, lots of bacteria, for example, multiply faster when the temperature is warm, warmer, or changes in virulence. So virulence is how much damage a pathogen does to a host when it causes disease. Uh, where I live currently is Seattle. And here about a month ago, we had a really un big unprecedented heat wave and that only lasted about four days. Uh, and it didn't affect seawater temperatures, but it did occur at a time when we had pretty big uh, low tides during the day. And so in Puget Sound, that meant that during the day, a lot of bivalves were exposed to really warm air temperatures and this caused a lot of death of bivalves, but in oysters, which um, those that survived, there was an increase in Vibrio bacteria. Vibrios cause all kinds of different diseases, in this case, um, an intestinal disease. And this, so people were getting sick eating these raw oysters. Um, and it was due both to the um, warmer temperature causing faster replication of the Vibrios and also an increase in the virulence or the amount of damage that these vibrios cause. Another thing that we see that happens uh, with warmer temperatures are, is called a dysbiosis, which is really just a change in the community of microorganisms that are populating maybe the surface of the host or its gut or other cavities in the host. Uh, and so 
in a healthy organism, uh, they have a community of microorganisms that can actually be very protective against, uh, against uh, invasion by a pathogen. However, when the host becomes stressed, for example, due to temperature or other stressors, then other pathogens are actually able to colonize. And these, these are usually what are called opportunists. So these are things that are already in the environment and that usually um, are not able to colonize the host or maybe are just there in very low abundances. Um, so for humans, a good example would be something like, uh, like yeasts or E. coli, things that they're not uncommon, um, but um, they're only pathogenic if when we're kind of compromised in some way. If these opportunist pathogens are able to colonize the host, after some time, you start to see damage to the host and, and disease emerges. So this is called a dysbiosis and it's a change in the microbial community. And the example I'll be talking about later with lobsters is in fact a dysbiosis, a change in the microorganisms that are colonizing the shell of the lobster and causing disease. Climate change can alter the hosts too. Uh, so this can lead to numerous changes. One that we're seeing a lot um, in Maine is changing distributions of organisms. So species are moving, if they can, to find cooler water. This means they're going deeper or they're going northward. Um, and actually in Maine, on average, across 140 species that were surveyed over 20 years, um, they are on average 60 feet deeper and 40 miles further north than they were um, in the early 1970s. So they're really changing their distributions. And you can imagine some species are moving more quickly than others. So this actually causes new interactions to occur and perhaps species are exposed to pathogens that they might not have been exposed to 40 years ago. Um, just like with pathogens, uh, potential pathogenic hosts um, have potentially faster development or increased reproduction in warmer temperatures. Um, so this again is something we might see in a lobster that at the southern end of the range, they're reproducing every after two or three years of growth, whereas all the way up in Newfoundland, it might take seven years for them to become reproductive. And the effect of temperature on things like reproduction and development depends on um, what we call a performance curve. So this is this graph at the bottom and you can see that as temperature increases, um, starting at the left, the performance, which could be its, its health, its uh, reproductive capacity, its generation time, it increases up to a certain point until it reaches an optimum. And then after that, it decreases rapidly. So depending where an organism is in relation to that, optimum, you might see its fitness actually improves with increasing temperature up to a point, and then it might get worse. It's very hard to predict these impacts of temperature on species because of this nonlinear relationship. Finally, we might see changes in immune function um, due to changing temperature. Uh, for example, you see corals in um, various um, tropical areas, they bleach, uh, when there's warm temperatures, that means they're rejecting this um, symbiotic algae. And after they bleach, they're also more susceptible to um, various diseases like the white band disease um, in this picture. So over time, you might wanna know, well, are diseases increasing or decreasing? Or what's the pattern? Is, are there trends? Is this something we should be more worried about? Uh, and it's a really hard question to answer. Uh, fortunately, um, Allison Tracy, who's another biologist, did a, a review of all the studies uh, on marine diseases since the early 1970s. And she looked across different uh, groups of organisms like corals, urchins, and mammals. And she could show that for two of these groups, the corals and the urchins, disease is actually increasing in recent years and that it is associated with warmer temperatures. So there seems to be some effect of climate change on the reports of disease that are occurring. She also looked at fish species. So crustaceans, sharks, fish, uh, bivalves, like 
um, oysters and mussels. And she could show the opposite pattern, that there were decreasing amounts of disease in these species that are fished, which is a little confusing. Um, and the hypothesis that she has is that the fish species are actually, their populations are going down because they're being fished and that actually results in less disease. Basically, we're pulling their parasites out of the water and their pathogens out of the water when we fish them. And because they're at lower densities, there's less opportunity uh, for transmission to occur. So uh, various uh, trends that depend on fishing and water temperature, um, but these are just reports of disease and it doesn't really look at the severity of these diseases that are occurring. And that might be uh, what we're interested in if we want to understand the impact of disease and how that might be changing. Well, disease is not always a bad thing in a population. Um, maybe it is if you're a human, but if you're a marine organism or a marine ecosystem, disease can actually uh, be positive. In some cases, it can increase overall biodiversity of an area by um, causing reductions in a very competitive organism that would outcompete everybody otherwise. Um, in eelgrass, it actually, uh, there's a pathogen that actually increases the amount of um, nutritional fatty acids that are important for um, crabs and snails and other organisms. Uh, so disease itself is not always bad, but in some cases it can be very high impact. And I was, part of a research group that had the task of deciding when some kind of management intervention uh, was, should be recommended uh, for marine disease. And we came up with criteria for this. And basically we said, well, if there's severe ecological, economic, or social impacts from a marine disease, then some kind of management should be recommended. So ecological impacts could be, for example, with the sea star wasting disease, which caused uh, losses of multiple species. Some of them were really critical players in intertidal zones. Uh, many of them are actually increasing now and in recovering. Um, or it could be due to eelgrass wasting, which um, is normally doesn't cause much damage in a system, but in the 1930s, it led to 90% loss of eelgrasses, which provide key habitat. 90% um, loss in um, the Northeast Atlantic Ocean. So that really affected fisheries and waterfowl and had all these um, cascading effects. If there's strong economic impacts, that could also require management. For example, coral diseases, which cause reductions in tourism in various locations or diseases in aquaculture. And this middle top panel shows a, a pinnaed shrimp. It's just showing the, the shell of the shrimp, which is covered with white spots. It has a white spot syndrome virus, which is um, caused more um, economic damage to the aquaculture industry than any other disease. Um, it's been very harmful and it's been a major um, endeavor to try to figure out ways to control it. Finally, those impacts could be social. So they could be um, zoonotic. Uh, for example, if you eat raw oysters and you get sick, um, that's obviously a human health risk. And so you might want to do some management by closing a beach uh, to, to uh, oyster fishing uh, or harvesting. And in the case of lobsters, if lobsters get sick and they have these ugly shells and they lose their market value, then that is a major blow to a fishing community. Um, so uh, again, that's a big social impact. So we think that these diseases that have major impacts, uh, e ecological, economic, or social, require some kind of management. But how do we actually measure kind of quantitatively what that impact is? It's, it's very difficult. Uh, disease is hard to observe in the oceans. Uh, we need to know what we're looking for, and often we have to develop new diagnostic techniques. Um, so this could be something like the, like a molecular technique or a way to um, quantify some kind of signs, uh, disease signs or symptoms on an organism. Uh, mortality is hard to observe. When a fish dies in the ocean, it's usually eaten very quickly. Um, so we might miss major mortality events. Um, pathogens are dispersed through water currents, which are really complex. And uh, so 
we know that they're not dispersed evenly throughout the ocean. So even knowing where disease might emerge is a little bit hard to predict. Um, and often there's huge knowledge gaps in both the host life cycle, particularly for migratory organisms that we might know where they are when they're on the coast, but not when they're in the uh, open ocean or pathogen life cycles. And in many cases, marine pathogens um, are just being discovered now. So we, we don't know a lot about them. Finally, there are some feasibility issues with lab or field studies. It's complicated to do an infection challenge of organisms um, and requires biosecurity in labs. And um, in some cases, it's just not feasible. So this is, this is challenging. And this is not to say it's impossible, but this is sort of a new frontier, is trying to measure impacts of marine diseases in, in these wild organisms. And the way that we do it, tends to involve having two kinds of data. We have disease data, surveillance data, which tells us how much infection or disease is occurring in a population. Often this is um, measured over time and it has to be uh, in relation to the, um, the life cycle or the pattern of that disease. If it's a fast acting disease, you might have to be out there every week monitoring it. Whereas if it progresses slowly, once a year might be enough. And then we also need population data that tells us, is the population declining or increasing um, over time? And we can use this data, combine it into a mathematical model and start to get some estimates of disease mortality and um, what proportion of the population is infected. And then we can get at something similar to impact, some estimate of the impact of a disease. Uh, so this is, this is something that requires a lot of data and, and is generally um, restricted to aquaculture and fisheries because we often have more data on um, economically valuable organisms. If we decide that there is some impact, um, we have a recommendation for how disease management should occur. So it requires um, different kinds of uh, processes. For example, we need the surveillance, the population surveillance and the um, disease surveillance to detect an issue. Uh, and if we detect that there's a high impact, we can either mitigate the disease directly by trying to control some, the host, the pathogen or the environment. Those three factors that are required to create disease um, to reduce disease overall. We also may try to mitigate the downstream impact. So if uh, there's a large economic impact or a, a ecological impact. There might be some kind of restoration or um, something like that to try to uh, mitigate that. And this is really dependent on um, basic and applied research to come up with recommendations ahead of time and suggestions and also communication like what I'm doing right now. If there needs to be some kind of management action for disease, it's much easier if, if the stakeholders know that, that this might be on the pipeline. So it's not a total surprise if a fishery is closed briefly or a beach is closed to commercial fishing uh, or recreational fishing, something like that. So there aren't too many examples of disease management yet. I think this is really a horizon that is going to be developing a lot over the next several de decades. Uh, three examples I wanted to share are um, related to fisheries. The first is with uh, snow crab. Um, in this top picture, you can see there's snow crab um, shown. And the ones that are on the left in both pictures have kind of a cooked appearance. And they're not cooked. They have um, a dinoflagellate infection that causes bitter crab disease, which means they taste really bad. Fishermen don't want them. Um, but unfortunately, if fishermen throw them back, they're just filled with parasites and they're going to infect other crabs. So now there's regulation up in Newfoundland that if fishermen uh, harvest crabs and they turn out to be diseased, they cannot discard them back into the water where they can spread more disease. Uh, the second example is with a what's called a spawn on kelp fishery. And this is for herring. Uh, so Pacific herring get a disease called viral hemorrhagic septicemia. And in this left panel, and in the middle, you can see there's this fish that has 
basically hemorrhaging. It's got kind of blood on its uh, fins and on its eye. Um, and this is a very lethal disease. And it turns out that this fishery where when herring are coming into spawn, um, fishermen will put them in a net with kelp. So they'll spawn on the kelp and then that kelp can be harvested for um, commercial use. Um, they're only in the net for about a week during spawning, but that is enough stress for this species that they will break with viral hemorrhagic septicemia. And it can not only infect the fish in the net, but those fish from outside of the net are attracted to the spawning. So it can lead to large outbreaks. Finally, just changing the timing of a fishery can, uh, can be used to manage disease. So for example, in the Yukon River up in Alaska, the timing of when um, indigenous people are allowed to do a subsistence catch uh, of Chinook salmon um, can change the number of fish they're getting that actually are infected uh, with a disease called ichthyophaniasis. So those are three examples of disease management. Um, and we're hoping there will be more because there have been some acts um, recommended in Congress. Um, none, of the, none of them have passed. Um, but essentially, they would enable um, rapid funding for these disease emergencies that we think require um, rapid funding. So to summarize, disease is an interaction, the host, the pathogen, and the environment. And it may be affected by climate change. Um, in many cases, we think it is. Uh, not all disease is bad, but in some cases, it does require intervention, and that's when it has really high social, economic, or ecological impacts. And new methods are being created, uh, modeling methods, mathematical methods, to quantify what those impacts are. Uh, so with that, um, that's the first half, and I would love to take some questions. Okay, thank you, Maya. Um, we have a couple. So does the lobster shell disease make eating, oops, does the lobster shell disease make eating the lobster more dangerous for humans? Great question. Uh, it does not. Um, the, the shell disease is, um, it's just, it's, it's on the surface of the shell. Um, and I'll talk about this more in the second section of the talk, but it, it causes these, um, basically bacteria are eating the shell away. And so it looks really ugly. And these lobsters that have bad shell disease are, um, no one wants to buy them because they don't look nice. You don't want to see an ugly lobster when you go out to dinner. Um, but actually a lot of lobsters have very low levels of shell disease um, and we eat them and um, there is no risk to humans. Excellent. Okay, um, are you planning to use artificial intelligence techniques to process um, and highlight your data inputs? Wow, that's a great question. Um, so that is something I would love to do. So artificial intelligence is a way to set up, um, set up sort of background programs that might be able to detect high levels of, or, um, disease occurring, if there's more reports or, um, I mean, it can be used in lots of different ways. Um, one way that I've explored using artificial intelligence is with um, looking at slides, um, so thin sections of organs of diseased animals and having an automatic um, classifier that basically can tell you this one is diseased and this one is healthy. Um, and it's, it's had, uh, it's a work in progress, <laughs> but I think there's an absolute enormous potential to use artificial intelligence, especially as we're getting more and more of these big data sets uh, to work with. Okay. Um, can we cure marine diseases? Yeah, so that's um, probably not possible. So curing a marine disease um, is a really large task. <laughs> We don't necessarily want to throw medicines or um, therapeutics into the water, but we can manage diseases. So we can manage them so that maybe they have less impact um, and we can monitor their impact. So 
curing, I think, is, is something we restrict more to um, human health or pet health um, and less to uh, wildlife, unless it's uh, incredibly severe. Okay, and how, and this will be the last one, um, how can we manage disease, wait a minute, how can we manage diseases that are facilitated by climate change? Right, so that's a tough one, right? It's hard to actually manage climate change, <laughs> right? We're all struggling with that one. Um, so if a disease is facilitated by warming waters, we might have to pick something else to manage in that disease system. So we could manage the host. Um, so perhaps um, if there's a invasive fish that is spreading that disease um, and then climate change is increasing that, uh, the, that invasion, maybe we can manage that invasive fish. So we have to be creative about it. Um, but I think there's, there's often management options available. Okay, and there is one more came in that's relevant yep. to the previous question. Um, and that is, is the Eastern Canada lobster fishery similarly affected? Um, yes, yeah, so this will, I'll answer this in my the second half of the talk, but the, the short answer is that the shell disease is really prevalent south of Cape Cod, but as waters are warming, um, there is concern that it will be spreading further north. It's, so it's, it, this is a, a disease that is facilitated by warming temperatures. Okay, well, so take it away for the second half. All right, thank you. Great questions. So epizootic cell disease uh, causes these um, lesions and pitting. You can see on this picture, um, you can tell where the, the disease is occurring. It's, it's caused by bacteria that um, are opportunistic. So the suite of bacteria that normally cause the, that colonizes the shell, there's normally bacteria there, but the population and the members of that community changes and you get more and more of these bacteria that actually consume the exoskeleton or the shell of the lobster. Um, so this tends to happen um, at temperatures above 12 degrees, that's 54 Fahrenheit. Um, so it needs warmish temperatures uh, to occur and it seems to increase as the temperature gets warmer. And it's what we call an emerging disease. Um, so this first appeared in the mid 1990s uh, in Long Island Sound, and it has uh, spread um, outwards from there and is found all the way up into uh, Maine. This disease is not um, transmission, so the like the um, movement of a pathogen from one individual to another is not kind of the limiting step in initiating disease because these are opportunistic pathogens. They're everywhere. And many lobsters, healthy ones, already have very small um, amounts of these opportunistic pathogens on their shell. So it's not that they need to be exposed to the pathogen, it's that they need to be stressed for those pathogens to have a bigger impact and begin to eat away at their shell. So um, they having two lobsters in a, in a pot interacting isn't necessarily going to cause disease transmission for this particular case. But if they're in really stressful situations like high temperatures, um, you might see disease emerge. So the range of the American lobster is really large. Um, it's found off the coast um, in deep waters off North Carolina, and then ranges all the way up into uh, and past Newfoundland. In the United States, it, the lobster is, is managed into three stocks. There's the Southern New England stock in yellow, the Gulf of Maine stock, and the Georgia's Bank stock. And the Georgia's Bank and the Gulf of Maine stock are often managed together because they, it's thought that it's actually a single population there. So this disease uh, emerged in the Southern New England stock. Uh, in Long Island Sound, so uh, where my cursor is right here. If we look at the patterns of the population abundance in southern New England, you can see that they increased 
1999, and then there was a rapid decrease. And that coincides with around the time that uh, epizootic shell disease uh, became more common. And we haven't been able to say, yes, this is definitely the cause of this decline, but we have a lot of data, which I'll present some of, that suggests that it, it's contributing. And you might ask, well, why did the population rise so rapidly prior to this? Well, as, as temperatures have warmed, um, conditions are better and better for lobsters. They're reaching that thermal optimum. So they have uh, faster reproduction, faster growth, faster development, um, and fishing happens more. And so because the lobster fishery is inefficient, it means that when a when pots are out in the water with food, lobsters are walking in and out of those pots um, again and again until they're too big to actually leave the pot. So they're actually being ranched basically and fed, um, which also increases the population. So those are the hypotheses as to why the population increased so much. And I'll be presenting on epizootic shell disease, which is why I think in part the lobster population has decreased so much. So, I got to work uh, with this amazing data set on lobsters, which was collected uh, in Long Island Sound beginning in 1982 and is actually still ongoing. Um, this is part of the Millstone Power Plant um, research team. So they want to make sure there's no impacts from the power plant on Long Island Sound. It's a nuclear plant. So they have been checking the lobster population three times a week from May through October since 1982. So this means they put 60 traps out two to three times a week and every lobster that they catch, they put a little tag in it. You can see in this bottom panel, there's a lobster with a tag in it. So they can keep track of how often they recapture lobsters. And then once the disease appeared, they could keep track of, well, are we more or less likely to capture, recapture a lo uh, lobster if it has a disease? Um, so this is an incredible data set, and it's um, the, there's over 200,000 lobsters that have been tagged over this time, and about a 25% recapture rate. If we look at what their data looks like, um, here's just a, a subset of it. Um, so this you can see is the prevalence or the proportion of lobsters that are caught that have this disease, epizootic shell disease. And what you can see is that um, the, the data looks like a series of check marks. So it begins, um, if we look at one check, it starts in May when they're starting to collect data and then the, the prevalence decreases and then it increases again. And what is causing that is actually molting. So in June and July, after the uh, data collection has started, these lobsters molt and when they molt, they're able to discard their diseased exoskeleton or shell and get rid of this disease. Uh, so the proportion or the prevalence of the disease goes way down. And then after they molt, as the summer gets hotter and there's more disease occurring, um, the disease prevalence goes up. So I had two research questions about uh, related to these patterns I was seeing. And the first was, well, does the timing of the molt alter the amount of uh, disease we're seeing in the lobster? If they molt earlier or later, is that going to affect how much disease is occurring? And the second was what drives the molt timing? So these questions are related to a idea called, or concept called phenology, which is the study of the seasonality of, um, events in an organism's or species life cycle. So it could be something like the abundance of individuals in a certain area or the timing of reproduction, or in my case, the timing of molting. So seasonal events are driven by cues. So they could be cues like rainfall, temperature, length of day or lunar cycles. And some of these are affected by climate change like temperature, while others like the length of day are not affected by climate change. And this can lead to shifts in phenology or the seasonality of these events. And what can happen is called a phenological mismatch where say one organism is highly abundant in an area to take 
uh, advantage of a food source that's there. When you have a phenological mismatch, maybe there's a, there's a reduced amount of overlap with that research resource. This is something we see a lot with um, migratory songbirds that they might be appearing in areas, migrating to areas before the invertebrate food sources that they're dependent upon are available. So you could see a reduced overlap with a resource or an increased overlap with a threat, like a predator that they might um, have otherwise avoided or a disease. Uh, so in Long Island Sound, the cue that I'm interested in in relation to molting is temperature. And that is because temperature in Long Island Sound, uh, similar to temperature in Maine, it's, it's warming faster than most ocean temperatures. Uh, so these are data just on the temperature, uh, winter temperature on the left and summer temperature on the right. And you can see there's this positive slope. So that means that temperature is increasing over time and has increased um, about a degree Celsius um, in winter temperatures over less than 40 years and a degree and a half in the summer. So pretty dramatic increases in temperature in Long Island Sound. So kind of putting all these ideas together, temperatures are changing and molting might be affected by temperature uh, and molting is important for disease. I came up with a series of hypotheses. The first is that molt timing is altered by temperature. The second is that molting is important for reducing disease, uh, which I think I sort of showed you with the data previously. And third, that the amount or the prevalence of disease is greater when lobster is molt earlier and when seawater is warmer. Uh, and then finally, that mortality of lobsters that are diseased is higher than that of healthy lobsters. So that this disease is actually bad for lobsters and is, aside from being kind of ugly, it actually has a negative impact on their populations. So for this first hypothesis, I looked at the timing of molting. When do, mol when do lobsters molt in the relation to the temperature of the water? So we were able to use that big data set to estimate the timing of molting in relation to the May temperature. And what we found was this relationship where if it's warm, the average May temperature is 13 degrees, um, the onset of molting is earlier. Whereas if it's cooler, they molt as many as uh, four weeks later. So they are affected by temperature. And one reason that this is important is because if they molt early, if they molt in May as opposed to June or July, that means that they had the entire summer to develop disease without having that opportunity to molt and get rid of it. So they basically don't have a reset. Um, this is their only strategy to manage this disease. Secondly, molting reduces disease. And, and I showed you this with this checkmark data that you can see that the amount of disease decreases around the time that these lobsters are molting. The third hypothesis is that shell disease increases when spring molting occurs earlier and when the temperature is warmer. So I ran a number of models and I was able to show that in a normal summer with normal molt timing, so um, kind of your average year, about 30% of lobsters would have uh, epizootic shell disease. So I just made those lobsters gray. Um, so 30% would have shell disease. If you have a regular summer, but the spring is warm, so that means that the lobsters are molting earlier um, and they have this big intermolt period where they can develop disease, the disease increases a little bit. So it's about 40% are infected. If you have both a warm spring and a hot summer, uh, about 65% of lobsters have epizootic shell disease. So temperature has a really big impact and it's both through how it affects the timing of the molt and how it affects um, the stress of the lobsters basically in the summer after they molt and um, their susceptibility to this disease. Uh, finally, we wanted to know how much mortality occurred um, when these lobsters 
are sick. So we ran another model called a mark recapture model um, to estimate mortality of healthy lobsters relative to mortality of disease lobsters. And we found that the mortality for the most part occurs in the winter. So every month, 65% of disease lobsters are estimated to die. So that means in November, 65% die, December, 65% die, and so on and so on. So by early spring, the prevalence or the proportion of lobsters that have disease is pretty low. And you might think, okay, this population is pretty healthy unless you look at the population size. Um, so it's a pretty lethal disease, um, particularly in the winter. And we don't know why the mortality is occurring in the winter. We also found that lobsters die when they're molting. So molting is in June and July. And we found that between seven, sorry, 50 and 75% of disease lobsters are not able to molt successfully. Um, and so molting occurs um, just in one month. And we know why this happens. When the, the lobster is diseased and it has those pits and lesions on its shell, sometimes adhesion occurs. So that old shell is, is basically stuck to the new shell. And so the lobster can't molt completely. So it's kind of a, it's a risky behavior. It can be um, really beneficial to molt, but it can also be deadly. Uh, so kind of complicated um, uh, life history change. So collectively, this study showed that in the winter, if you have warming winter and spring temperatures, you might get early molting of lobsters. So they discard their old shell and that could lead to a temporary reduction in disease. But because they've got this long time period uh, between that previous molt um, and during the summer when uh, infection progresses more quickly, that leads to an increased proportion of lobsters or prevalence that have shell disease. And that's exacerbated if it's a warm summer. And finally, we show that those lobsters are most likely to die during winter. So there's this very seasonal pattern to this disease. Uh, and I think we're starting to understand some of the temperature drivers behind it. Um, one of the things I think is exciting about this study is that we actually didn't look at the, um, at the pathogen directly. So we could, understand the impact of this disease without actually looking under the hood and seeing what kind of pathogens um, were causing the disease itself. Um, and I put this picture here of a, lot, a dog with a lobster suit just to say, you know, the risk is that you miss something uh, really important and obvious if you do this, but it's also pretty powerful in terms of um, understanding population impacts and being able to do so without having all of the other information in place, which is often the case. So bringing this back to Maine, Maine has um, a booming lobster industry um, worth more than $600 million in some years. Um, and Maine is seeing a big increase in the lobster population due to warming temperatures, as well as fishing and again, ranching of, of lobsters. Uh, so the question is, is shell disease going to impact these populations? And if you look at historical temperatures, um, you want to know whether temperatures are going to exceed 12 degrees, because that's kind of the threshold where this disease starts to emerge. So in Maine, this is a um, showing average temperatures between 1982 and 2008. And you, we can look for 12.5 is kind of the tan color here. And you can look up in Maine and you can see, well, that's just not occurring historically. So historically temperatures prohibited this disease from occurring. And you can see Long Island Sound is pretty warm. So disease, as we know, could occur in that area. If we look at projected temperatures in the future, um, the story's a little different. So this is um, using climate change projections of sea bottom temperatures. And what this is showing is when the temperature will reach 12 degrees. So red is showing it's going to reach 12 degrees in 2020, whereas blue is saying it's projected 
under this particular climate change scenario um, that it will reach 12 degrees in 2060. And you can see that there's a lot of red up here. Um, and there's also a lot of gaps where the climate change model was not able to make an estimate. Um, so it suggests that shell disease could come to Maine um, or increase in Maine in the future. And it is seen in Maine. It, previously, it was about 0.1% of the population. And now it's um, the most recent data that I've seen shows it's about 1% of the population that, that has some level of epizootic shell disease. Uh, so that's the end of the shell disease part of this. Uh, we do have a little bit of future research that we want to do. We have some funding to basically improve the um, forecasts. Um, so basically something like this map, we want to actually include how we think the molt timing is going to be affected by temperature and use both the molt timing and the projected temperature to, to figure out where the highest risk for shell disease is in the future. And then secondly, we're going to look at a different shell disease. And this one is occurring in snow crabs up in the Bering Sea. And what it does um, is it causes uh, crab eyes to turn black, like this one in the middle panel, and eventually atrophy um, and disappear, like this in this bottom panel. And that's a concern, not so much for the vision of these crabs, but because there are organs within the eye stock that are important for regulating molting and reproduction and stress, responses to stress. So we wanna understand what's causing this and, and if it has a bad impact on the snow crabs. And we're going to be looking at this with a climate change lens and looking at how temperature and ocean acidification might be associated with uh, this emerging disease. So uh, I'm just gonna put this up here so you can see I did not do this work by myself and had some wonderful funding sources um, that contributed um, and in particular Dominion Energy, which gave us access to that wonderful lobster data set. Um, and I would love to take your questions. Thank you very much for listening. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, we've got a number of questions. Um, do fish farms offer any concerns? Um, I'm guessing you mean um, related to disease. And I would say all farms have disease risk. So when you put animals at high concentrations or organisms, um, plants as well, with single populations, um, there that is that is like having a bunch of kids in school together, where there are high densities, and you know, you know, colds emerge in kids, or um, it's kind of the same situation where it's sort of a great opportunity for transmission to occur, and that risk has to be managed. Um, so there's lots of different ways to manage that. Um, on fish farms, there's um, various antibiotics and um, other treatments that the fish are given um, and also rules about when the fish are um, harvested or where they're placed that are designed to reduce the disease risk, but certainly that is always a risk. Um, yes. Okay. Here's a question. I don't know if you are going to know this because you're not at the Gulf of Maine yet, but mm -hmm. um, do we understand the reason that the Gulf of Maine and Long Island Sound are warming faster than most other ocean water? I, I actually don't. Um, and I know that that is occurring um, and I've seen the maps, but I actually don't know. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a very quick lesson for our newest senior research scientist. So what is happening in the Gulf is there's this very, you know, large warm current, the Gulf Stream that comes up the east coast of the United States. And then we've got cold currents coming down from the Arctic. And right now, because of climate change, that Arctic current is getting a little bit weaker and the Gulf Stream is, is moving more and swinging over more often into the Gulf of Maine. So it's, it's, a, it's based on currents. Um, so just for future reference, Maya. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, 
Let's see, what's the next question? What is the difference in shell disease for hard shell versus soft shell lobsters? Things like frequency, lethality. Uh huh. So a soft shell lobster is a lobster that has just molted. So if a lobster is able to molt successfully and get rid of its old shell, its hard shell, um, it is unlikely to have disease. And sometimes when a lobster has molted, you'll see scars on the shell from the um, disease that the old shell that was diseased, it might scar the new shell, but generally they have very low levels of disease. Um, and then as to the time passes that they their, their shell gets harder and then um, more time passes, um, the, they're more and more likely to have developed disease. Okay, um, are the ESD bacteria themselves subject to pathogens? <laughs> that's a wonderful question. And that's actually um, a disease management um, option for, not for shell disease, I'm not aware of that, um, but for other marine diseases. For example, there's a bacteria that um, infects abalone and it has a virus um, called a phage that infects it. And when the phage infects the bacteria, the bacteria does not cause um, as bad of a disease in the abalone. Um, so I think the odds are pretty high that there are viruses that infect the bacteria, but I am not aware that anyone has looked at that. So Maya, we have a scientist that I don't, you probably didn't meet. His name is, um... Joaquin Martinez Martinez, mm -hmm. and he's a virus guy. He's on leave right now serving at the National Science Foundation, but. Yeah, I you... like that question a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll you... have to look into that. Okay, a new one just came in. Does the disease impact the eatability of the lobster? Uh, it does, I guess, if you're um, concerned about appearances if it's kind of grosses you out, um, but it's not harmful. If you cook a lobster with shell disease, um, you are not going to get an infection. Um, first, because you're, you're killing everything when you cook it, um, but I'm not aware of any issues there. The lobsters that have shell disease and are harvested, they go to canning. Um, so they're not worth as much, but they still, um, they are still eaten by us. Excellent. And being mindful of the time, um, I think we're going to, uh, I'm going to conclude the question and answer and thank Maya um, for just a, a great talk. We can't wait to get you, um, get you in Maine. And uh, unfortunately, there's a need in the state for your expertise. I wish there wasn't, but there is. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I'm looking forward to it too. Excellent. So can you go to the next slide? Okay, thank you, Maya. So um, I hope all of you will join us next week. So that will be our, what is that? That's our third, This that'll be our fourth. Oh my God, the, the summer is going, is blasting through. So on August 3rd, uh, Dr. Nicole Poulton, she has recently been promoted to a senior research scientist. And she is going to tell us about persistent plastics using familiar tools and new ways to explore the impact of microplastics. And with that, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, I hope you have a, a wonderful evening and um, hope to see you next week.